Hello and welcome back. Today I'm going to talk about analysis. In order to conduct a fruitful analysis, you simply must develop and employ sound critical thinking skills. And in order to think critically, we must clearly understand and appreciate the difference between objectivity and subjectivity, absolute and relative truth, and facts and opinions. Depending upon your prior education and experience, you may know a great deal about analysis, or you may know very little about it. It's been my experience that the majority of students in a composition class have not been exposed to much in the way of formal analysis. It's worth reiterating as a sidebar here that these PowerPoint lectures are necessarily succinct and should therefore be supplemented by the readings in your textbooks as well as some online research. Whatever research and reading it takes for you to grasp these points you need to do. An analytical frame of mind is essential to the bottom line which is the quality and effectiveness of your analytical essays. Analysis is the breaking down of a system into its component parts and the evaluation of how well those parts function both separately and together. An efficacious analysis of anything, whether it's a contract, a relationship, a corporation, or a short story, employs and necessitates the critical thinking skills of defining terms or component parts, gathering and evaluating the evidence, and moving step by step from the suppositions you draw from that evidence to a tentative thesis and eventually to a final thesis and conclusion. The best analysts are the most skilled critical thinkers and vice versa. It all begins with objectivity, which is easier said than done. That means you're detached, dispassionate, and unbiased in your perceptions and ideas. Can you or anyone be completely objective? The answer is no. We are all invariably and inevitably shaped and affected by our paradigms, our point of view, our heredity, environment, socioeconomic perspective, life experiences, strengths, weaknesses, and vested interest. The best we can do is attempt to put our biases aside and look dispassionately at the issue, system, or text that we are analyzing. That's called formal criticism. When we attempt an evaluation of the words on the page without any of our own feelings or the world's information to alter what we read and understand. And that's impossible, isn't it? Formal criticism, though it's perhaps a noble undertaking, is nonetheless a utopian ideal rarely achieved. Subjective bias is inevitable. Thus, it's best if we admit to ourselves up front they are, that we are bound by what Joseph Conrad calls the ball and chain of our personality. We are bound to see things through our own unique lenses, forming our own limited perspectives. Any illusion that we can somehow be completely objective is a dangerous delusion. We must accept our subjectivity as we accept the grammatical I, that subject position from which we syntactically arrange the world, and realize that our analyses, our critical thinking itself, is bound to be flawed. If we accept and acknowledge our human fallibility and subjectivity, we'll become better critical thinkers. By being honest with our audience and ourselves, we're more on the lookout for flaws in our analysis, and we're triumphing, at least momentarily, over hubris, that deadly sin of pride which clouds our eyes and obscures our vision from any apprehension of truth with a capital T. Before we can fully engage our critical thinking skills, it's important to ground ourselves in self-awareness and a thorough grasp of objectivity and subjectivity. In essence, we attempt to be objective by recognizing and regulating our subjectivity. We must strike a balance between them, being as objective as possible regarding our subjective positions. It's perfectly natural, in other words, for us to be subjective. That's human nature, as my quoting of Conrad alludes. 
But scholars learn to discriminate between their subjective opinions and the subjective opinions that others hold. All people, in other words, have their own perspectives. Which brings up the sticky issue of absolute versus relative truth. This is a most problematic philosophical, theological, political, and sociological issue. The debates rage through academia and the world at large over how many, what, and even whether or not there are any absolute truths. Or if everything, every idea, every principle, every notion is relative to one's perspective, paradigm, or culture. This debate is fundamental to analysis and critical thinking. Why? Because what may be true for you may not be true for someone else. Let's take just two examples for now. First, how about the statement that welfare is good? Well, perhaps it is for you if you are receiving government assistance. But for those who are not, yet are paying higher taxes because of welfare, it's not so good, is it? Let's take another example. Eminem is better than Bruce Springsteen. Well, again, if Eminem talks to you, if he's where you're coming from, and Springsteen doesn't talk to you, he's not where you're coming from, then for you, it's a truth that Slim Shady's better than the boss. However, if you're a little older and relate more to Bruce, he's better than Marshall. Note that I've used three different names for them both, which seems to call into question their own relative identities, doesn't it? A little history's in order here. Prior to the 1960s, it was believed by the vast majority of people that there were quite a few absolute truths. Then came the sex, drugs, and rock and roll revolution, along with the rise of feminism, the Vietnam War, and the deconstructionists in philosophy. The rise of the new left liberalism tore at the very fabric of nearly every moral and absolute social truth. Whether these were positive or negative changes is not for me to say. As Fox News Channel says, we report, you decide. My point is, however, that from thenceforward, radical relativism has been in fashion. Perhaps you've heard of the cultural relativists who suggest that nothing is better than anything else, that all cultures are equal, and that to judge is to discriminate and be guilty of racism, sexism, speciesism, etc., etc. This movement against making any discriminatory value judgments gained strength and credibility when associated with the civil rights movement and a little later the gay rights movement, so that today's generation and today's politically correct thinking, for better or worse, you be the judge, accepts as truth the notion that there are few, if any, absolute truths, and that all truths are relative and all opinions are valid if shared and espoused by some culture or lifestyle. I share the above overview with you as a caution and a guide for your own forays into analysis. In today's climate, you are at once free to think and believe anything you want without discriminatory judgments against those thoughts. All must be tolerated. However, if you hold politically incorrect opinions or beliefs, no matter how valid or heartfelt, you will not be tolerated. So, there's a fundamentally contradictory irony in the radical relativist's position. If they hold that all is relative, then that sentence itself is contradictory, because all is an absolute. Furthermore, as I noted above, the politically correct crowd and the radical relativists are generally one and the same. They scoff at the notion of any absolute moral or philosophical truths, while simultaneously insisting that their politically correct positions are absolutely correct. They attempt, in other words, to enforce tolerance through intolerance of dissenting viewpoints. I elaborate on the above points not just as a primer or warning, to, but to make a profound point about analysis. To analyze is to discriminate, to make judgments, to say that one thing is better than another, to determine what is true and what is false, and to suggest how best to act upon those conclusions. Therefore, if you subscribe to the radical relativist politically correct way of thinking, then your analytical hands are tied, 
and you run the risk of being ostracized and condemned for having an opinion that does not correspond to the correct one. By its very nature, political correctness is counterproductive to a healthy society. So, do you see the fundamental contradiction in such a position? Ultimately, analysis comes down to discriminating between facts and opinions. This relates to the preceding discussion in two essential ways. First, objectivity seems to imply you are dealing with facts, whereas subjectivity implies you are dealing with opinions. Second, the debate about absolute versus relative truths and perspectives is itself contingent on the distinction between facts and opinions. Since, as I mentioned close to the top, the first step in analytical critical thinking is to define your terms, how might we define a fact? Some thing, some issue, some belief that almost every rational person everywhere would agree is a true and accurate representation of reality. But do we see how slippery that definition is? Note the almost, which allows for exceptions. And how do we define a rational person? Or a true and accurate representation of reality? What is true? What is accurate? What is a representation? And what the heck is reality? We just can't get away from subjectivity, from relativity. We must struggle endlessly, it seems, to arrive at a definition we can all agree upon. So, undeniably, viewpoints, positions, terms, words themselves, are agonizingly complex and difficult to settle. They can always be traced further back, as the deconstructionists note. Thus, even the very first step of defining terms often hangs us up in analysis. But let's go with that definition of fact and add to it the definition of opinion or inference as something, some idea, some belief, which may or may not be true and needs factual support to prove it's a fact. Well, that definition is a little easier than a fact because what isn't a fact must be an opinion. Of course, what's a fact to you is just an opinion to someone else who holds the opposite viewpoint and vice versa. It's very frustrating, isn't it, to believe something is an absolute fact and to be confronted by someone else who believes it's not a fact at all. Thus, the necessity for a rigorous analysis and discriminating critical skills. The point is that those who have been raised on the tolerance and non-judgmental propaganda of the radical relativists and PC crowd need to be reconditioned. In the interest of us all getting along, many people have had it drilled into their heads to not discriminate, not make judgments, not think that one thing is any better than any other thing, not criticize, and to be tolerant of every opinion and every viewpoint. But such an approach to life is not only counterproductive, it's hypocritical. We all make judgments and discriminations all day long. It's what our minds do. We have to in order to survive. So let's talk facts, which, by the way, are essential to good arguments, which are themselves shaped after and in conjunction with rigorous analysis. You cannot write a good persuasive argument without having done a rigorous analysis of the material. So, what is a fact? Well, here are some examples. It's a fact you're sitting in a computer screen right now reading this. It's a fact this is a PowerPoint presentation. It's a fact that you're a human being. And it's a fact that this is an HCC class. It's not necessarily a fact, but rather it's an opinion that you're fully comprehending and going to apply what you're reading. That this is the best PowerPoint presentation you've ever watched. That you're a rational, conscientious human being. Or that this is a great HCC class. Notice in these four cases what turned the fact into an opinion, an adverb or adjective. Amazing, isn't it? Very often the opinions lie in the lowly add-ons to the verbs and nouns, the adverbs and adjectives, fully, best, rational, conscientious, and great, are all opinions. 
They may be facts, but they need evidence to support them. They are often the part of speech that makes a thesis statement a thesis statement. So what do you need to do now? Unless you've absorbed it all, watch and listen to this lesson again. I've made many points that are absolutely, and I use that word advisedly, absolutely essential to analysis and therefore to writing good, solid, analytical essays. Read the text on analysis and critical thinking and surf the net looking for more information about analysis and critical thinking. In the next lecture, I'll discuss how to write an evaluation of a text. Thanks for your attention, and I'll see you next time.